Well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to today's program. My name is Anne. I'm a librarian with LA County Library. And today's program is on Climate Science 101. And we have a speaker here uh, from uh, JPL. His name is Daniel Limonati. And he will talk to us about a few things. Um, he has been with JPL for a very long time since 1999, and um, we're going to have him talk to us. If Daniel, are you here? Yes, I am. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my okay, screen, great. and then I'm going to put you as the presenter. Great. Thanks, Ann. So, yeah, as Ann said, I'm Daniel Luminati. I'm the chief system engineer at, and the earth science director at, at the jet propulsion lab, which is a federally funded lab that works mostly for NASA. So I've been doing spacecraft stuff for about 25 years and have been focusing on earth science missions for roughly the last six years or so. Um, let me share my screen now. So nice to see, I, I'm bummed I can't see you guys. I like doing outreach talks you know, where I can actually see everybody, but obviously COVID times, that's a little hard. Um, appreciate you guys being here, taking the time out of your day to kind of check in and listen. So, as Ann said, right, we'll be hitting some basic climate change 101 stuff um, and then uh, transition into careers in STEM, engineering and science, where you can help. If you want to help play in, this, in the climate world and help fix things, um, you know, I'll help you get some ideas for how you might be able to do that uh, when, you're, when you get older. So and one thing I wanted to do with Daniel, this. Sorry, yes. before you get started, I do have uh -huh. one more thing I want to mention. Sure, go ahead. This event actually is sponsored specifically by Edison International and LA County Library Foundation. So um, that is very important because that's how we can have this program happen. <laughs> uh, but definitely another thing I want to mention too is if people uh, cannot hear us, I do uh, want to put down our phone number um, in case you have any issues on the chat. So then you can dial in. And, um, and I will have my video off. However, I will be checking the chat often so I can see what your questions are. But other than that, please take it away, Daniel. Okay, great. Thanks, Ann. Yeah, and that's awesome that Edison's and you guys have these sponsors. I looked at the program. You guys have a lot of amazing lectures online, so it's really cool the library does that. Okay, so uh, I told you what I was going to talk about. I wanted to spend a little bit more time on this picture because it hits a lot of things, right? So this is the view from the International Space Station, which is a few hundred miles up, right, surfing the Earth. And there's a few things to point out here. One, you know, these lights, that's not natural stuff, right? All of these lights everywhere, those are all human cities and human settlements. And so you can kind of tell from space that there is a lot of people and we have an impact on the planet, right? Earth is kind of a natural and human combined system. So that'll come up a few times during the talk. And the other thing is you can see kind of the limb of the atmosphere here, right? That very narrow, thin blanket of air um, that's separating us from space, making it so we can live and breathe. And there's not a ton of it. It's a pretty thin, thin blanket. And so that will come up again during the talk, right? But it's also a beautiful planet um, and lots of cool things we can do here. And if, in case you didn't recognize, right, this is the Nile. This is North Africa, the Nile in Egypt, uh, Israel, and Lebanon over here, and then uh, Greece and Europe on top of the map. So, okay, so again, we're going to talk about climate change, a little bit of weather versus climate, talk about what's going on and why, just to give you guys a little bit of background. Um, that might make your heads hurt a little bit, but it's worth listening to. I'll try to be slow and again, definitely ask questions during the talk. Um, if I'm confusing you. I'll talk a little bit about the impacts and then we'll jump into careers. And I think uh, I forgot to mention so. Um, if you guys can put questions into the chat, I think Anne is going to moderate, as she said, and yes. we can do that anytime, right? So, Anne, if you think the question's appropriate, just go ahead and interrupt me, you know, speak up and inter interrupt me, and we'll pause the presentation and try to answer the question. So, yeah, someone did ask about the picture that you had showing on the first slide. Okay. Uh, that shows the image of the Africa and the Red Sea. Is that what it is? That's right. So, the Red Sea is the lower right hand corner here. Yep. Yeah. And someone said it's a really cool picture of how the earth looks. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right, so 
talked about the content. So a little bit of weather versus climate. People confuse this a lot, right? And, and sometimes people make statements like, oh, look, it's cold today. Therefore, climate change isn't happening. And it's like, not really. So just to be clear, right? Weather is what's happening kind of hour to hour, day to day at a given spot. Like in Los Angeles today, it was sunny. You know, of course, this is not us. Yesterday, if we were in Michigan, it snowed, right? The weather can change day to day. It has a lot of variability. Um, Climate is more long-term average of weather for a given spot. So, for example, in June, Southern California is usually mild, right? The weather, weather is usually mild. Uh, August in Southern California is usually very hot, right? That's Those are kind of climate statements. They're long-term average, like decade scale average conditions, right? That's how we differentiate those things. And so climate can have a long-term trend of change, including warming, which you know, I'll show you guys what's happening now, while weather can still have a lot of kind of day-to-day -day noise on that background trend, right? So it's important to kind of keep those two things clearly defined and different. All right, so a little bit of what's going on and why. Here's another cool, this is, I think, a painting inspired by real pictures from Earth. You can see some um, storm clouds, like anvils from storm clouds here over the ocean. Again, we live on an awesome planet. And one of the themes of the talk is going to be, let's not mess it up. Um, okay, so uh, basic stuff, right? Like what, what makes a planet warm, right? In our case, we have the sun. We've got a, the sun is, you know, this giant thermonuclear, basically fusion, you know, bomb that's going off continuously. It puts out a ton of energy and all the planets in the solar system, including the earth, absorb that energy on the surface. And they emit, you know, like, if you have a, something in steady state temperature, right, you have to emit the same amount of energy that you're absorbing. Otherwise, you're going to be increasing or decreasing in temperature. And the Earth has been substantially, like, you know, roughly steady state, but it hasn't really been changing much over the last few thousand years. So the incoming energy is, was roughly equal to the outgoing energy. Um, so that's kind of point number one. Point number two, right, so the atmosphere actually acts as a blanket. If we didn't have any atmosphere, the Earth would actually be kind of a snowball. It would be, you know, I guess in Fahrenheit, it would be below freezing, I think, most of the time, if I remember correctly, right? So, um, so the atmosphere is acting like a greenhouse or a blanket that, that helps stabilize the temperature. So greenhouse gases are not by themselves, they're not a bad thing. Right? It's just if you have too much of them compared to what the planet's used to, then it can be a bad thing. And so something to kind of keep in mind here is if you guys have ever been in a car, right? If you've been in a car on a sunny day with the windows closed and there's no air conditioning, you're going to notice the car is substantially hotter than standing outside, right? And that, that's basically when we say greenhouse effect, that's kind of a simple way to think about it. And so imagine cracking your windows a little bit, you know, like how much greenhouse gas you have is kind of like rolling the, wi the windows up and down a little, right? So if you only have a tiny amount of greenhouse gases, then your windows might be mostly open. And if you have a ton of greenhouse gases, your windows are going to be most like closed and you might have more windows, right? Letting more light in. So for example, Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect which we're, uh, you know, it's, an, it's our sister planet. It's a little bit closer to the sun, but it, because it has so much greenhouse gases, it's hot enough to melt lead on the surface of Venus, right? We definitely don't want to ever get that hot. So that's the basics. We talked about that stuff. And so a little bit of what is a greenhouse gas, right? Not all gases are greenhouse gases. And, um, you know, depending on the gas, some of them let different kinds of light through without absorbing them, and some of them, some gases absorb uh, infrared infrared light. And so, what you see here is basically CO two, right, carbon dioxide, and water H two O and CH four methane. Those are the main greenhouse gases, and they are invisible. They let regular sunlight pass through, and then when the Earth is emitting in the infrared. Right, those infrared rays, they actually get absorbed by these molecules and then re radiated. And a lot of that re radiation comes back down to the earth, and that's what warms us up. And again, it's basically because these molecules vibrate a certain way that they absorb different wavelengths of light. So that, that's how it kind of works from a physics perspective. 
And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So stay with me in this diagram. I know it can be a little bit intimidating. But basically, what this is showing is a couple things. One, the red curve is basically power or like power emissions from something that is 5,000 degrees Kelvin. Like, so the surface of the sun is basically 5,500 degrees Kelvin. And it puts out energy in the ultraviolet and visible and a little bit in the infrared. But because it's really hot, right, this is really high temperature, most of its energy emission is kind of in this visible regime. It's actually why our eyes, right, kind of work where they do, because that's where most of the energy from the sun is coming from. It makes it easier to see. And so as things get cooler, like your body, right, um, the, the wavelength of emissions gets longer. So you are, you, your body is more like 300 Kelvin um, and you emit in the infrared, right? So that's why people, you can put on infrared goggles and at night, you know, if you're whatever in the military or, you know, if you just have some hobby goggles, you can see animals and people in the infrared because they're much colder. So they emit energy in the, in the infrared, right? If you were as hot as the sun, you'd be dead, but you know, for the one second that you were that hot, you'd be really bright white light, right? So like white light versus you know red, red hot or white hot, right? Those things are different. So the sun emits out here, and that's where all the incoming energy is. And then again, the earth is emitting in the infrared, and that's important. And we'll talk about that. So it turns out the atmosphere, and I'll get over this in a minute, you know, it has windows, right? Because of the gases in the atmosphere, they absorb different wavelengths. And so what you see here. This gray stuff is basically all the wavelengths that atmospheric gases absorb light in. And so you can see there's a huge window, just like your car, right? The glass in your car lets in the visible light from the sun, oops, um, but it blocks a lot of the infrared light. So, and what you can see back here, there is an atmospheric window out here where most of the infrared light, light then basically leaks out, but all this other stuff these other wavelengths, which means different temperatures, you know, things that are emitting, they get blocked, right? And so then this just kind of breaks it down to different gases. You can see water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, right? Those are the main gases that are blocking the, the light, and that's what's kind of causing greenhouse gases. So I don't know, and if there were any questions that were relevant to that stuff so far that you might want to pass on? Not quite okay. Um, okay. relevant to the climate talk, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, that's fine. Thank you for filtering. Um, there was one question of how hot does the moon get? Oh, uh, you know, that's that's a great question. The moon, because it doesn't have an atmosphere, it gets, the surface can get to be like 200 degrees, you know, in the daylight and then like minus 200 degrees, at, you know, so roughly, I forget the exact numbers at night, right? Because it doesn't have that blanket, it has no blanket. So when it's in the sunlight, you know, it gets roasted and the lunar day is also two days long. So it gets roasted for a long time. And then the lunar night is two weeks long and everything has a lot of time to just freeze. So good question. Okay, so then the other point, this is kind of the, the composition of the atmosphere, right? Of the different gases that make up the atmosphere by percentage. And you can see nitrogen, most everything is like nitrogen and oxygen, right? Nitrogen is kind of this filler gas. Oxygen, oxygen is that beautiful gas that you and I and all the animals on the planet need to live. Um, so a, there's not a ton of atmosphere and most of it is this, these gases that are basically invisible, right? They don't really block infrared or visible light very much. Um, so carbon dioxide, right? The greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, are all tiny, tiny fractions, right? Less than like 0.04%, right? So it's a tiny fraction of our atmosphere. So the, the point is, A, the atmosphere is not very thick and the fraction of the atmosphere that is actually doing the greenhouse job is a tiny, tiny fraction. So it's not very hard for humans, right? Now that there's 7 billion of us, it's not very hard for humans to actually mess with the mixture of the atmosphere because it's all this trace gas stuff in the atmosphere. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little sense, right? So then this is a little more complicated view of, you got incoming light, a bunch of it bounces back, some of it's absorbed, right? The earth, again, emits a bunch of power back out and the, those greenhouse gases end up reflecting, you know, this insulating blanket, right? All this power wants to leave, 
but a large, a huge fraction of it basically just gets pointed right back to us and keeps the planet warm. And so the more greenhouse gases you have, the more insulating blanket you have, and the more of this stuff just kind of stays down here, can't leave, you know, and go back into space. So that's, again, another version of talking about that greenhouse. So hopefully that's all as clear as mud. Um, any questions so far on that stuff? Okay. I think I, someone's typing. I think uh, there's okay. a question of um, how, um, when you measure the gas, how um, how how often do you measure it in terms of how it's emanated? That, uh, that that's a great question. So I mean, when we look at, I don't know if I have a good graph, right? So you know, we have tons of spacecraft that are flying around the Earth. Um, some of them are looking at the whole planet, like continuously others are in a low orbit, you know, like the space station, you know, like these kinds of orbits, and they only get to see small slivers of the planet at a time. And so, um, you know, it's a mixed bag, but it's enough to know, you know, the, the atmosphere composition is pretty well mixed um, and, and reasonably distributed on the planet. So, you know, we, we know very well, like how much CO2 there is and how much other stuff mm -hmm. like bulk quantity in the atmosphere. It, it's not changing super fast. What we have a little bit more trouble with is when there's point sources, like if there's a factory, you know, or a car, you know, a tailpipe from a truck or, you know, a giant tailpipe from a factory spitting out uh, carbon dioxide, those things are harder to see for us, you know, and we actually are just developing the satellites and sensing technology to be able to have enough capability to pinpoint individual kind of sources, like point sources on the okay. planet. Because that's actually, because anyway, hopefully that answers the question. I think it, that I, I think you did. Um, so okay. someone else asked, uh, how does the earth emit uh, the excess energy? So um, yeah, that's, that's a, another great question. So this, it's basically like a law of physics, right? If you are, if you have a temperature above absolute zero, unless you're like frozen to the absolute zero, which is like there's not a single molecule in your body vibrating at all, you will emit energy. You, you know, being matter, right? Not you necessarily a human. And so depending on the temperature of the thing, right? It emits, it just emits, you just generate photons, right? They just kind of come from um matter that's got any temperature above zero um so you're just generating photons and so the hotter you get the higher energy the photons are the photons just because you know higher and higher frequency higher and higher energy so it's, it's just kind of the way the universe works someone else asked a question it's very interesting mm -hmm. i'm not sure if you can answer this one okay. um, but why do you need both food and oxygen to survive um great question uh it's a little bit off from climate stuff but good we'll we'll do a little segue yes. so um <laughs> it's okay um so basically food is the fuel and you need oxygen just like an engine in a rocket or a car to turn the fuel into energy you actually have to take oxygen and kind of like basically burn the fuel and so your cells, um, you know, aerobic respiration, right? Biology, if, if you know, for animals or critters, any kind of life using oxygen, you're basically doing a slow control burn of fuel inside your body to turn it into molecules that can release energy. That's a very so good. That's why you need both. <laughs> okay. That's a very good answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, someone else asks. Uh, I don't know if you would have this answer. I too. think we have one more question that we can that we can go on. Yep. That sounds good. Uh, so this okay. question is, um, this person asked about physics. It's all physics. So mm -hmm. how does that um, astrophysics get involved? How does astrophysics get involved? So um, for the Earth, for climate, maybe a little bit less so. I mean, other than understanding how the sun works is also important. And I'll actually talk about that next. So, you know, there's other things. So astrophysics is like understanding how the universe evolves, understanding how stars behave and evolve. And there is a part of that that ties to climate, right? You could imagine 
if we lived in a solar system where the chun, the sun, the chun, the sun was changing uh, brightness a lot, right? That would wreak havoc on the climate of the planets, you know, in that solar system. And so it's a fair question to ask, like, hey, is climate changing because the sun is like being moody, right? Or is it because we're dumping, we're doing stuff with the atmosphere? And I'll actually hit that um, during the talk. So. Awesome. I think okay, we can move question. on. Awesome stuff. Great, great. Thanks for being engaged, folks, and asking questions. I, I love that. All right. So a um, little bit of now how climate has changed. So we just talked about the greenhouse effect and kind of what that, how that works, right? Some basic physics. And so one of the things I want to hit on is, look, the climate, you know, is anything but constant. Um, or, you know, the Earth is roughly four and a half billion years old. And this chart talks, this chart, it's a little complicated, but it's a really, really cool chart. So we're going to take our time to go through it. So this looks at temperature, like global mean temperature of the planet over the last 500 million years. Right, that's from zero. This is all time in the past. Zero is today, and then this the 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 scale kind of does weird things, right? So this is like thousands of years here, then it gets to one million, and then it goes to millions of years. So the scale is definitely kind of compressed on the left side, it goes all the way up to five hundred million years ago, and so you can see clearly it's not a flat line, right? The Earth has not been a boring place that's always been the same, and and you know the climate community doesn't say that it's always been the case, right? So Clearly stuff has changed around a lot. So there's a few interesting things here. You can see some big changes and some of these are kind of fun and interesting. Um, actually, let me hit, right? So the, what drives these changes, right? Like I list here in the text, you know, greenhouse gases have changed over time. Um, the, so the sun has actually from four and a half billion years ago gotten slowly um, brighter. Um, the orbital dynamics, uh, you know, of the planet of Earth changes a little bit, you know, atmospheric aerosols like dirt and dust in the air, you know, can affect the climate. Um, how the continents are shaped actually affects the climate. And I'll talk about that in a second. So there's lots of things that can change the climate. Right. And we think we understand it, it like most of those pretty well. And so some of the fun things back here. So roughly 300 million years ago, 400 million years ago, this big dip in temperature is actually when plants first colonized the continents, right? So you can kind of imagine the land masses of the earth before this point were mostly barren, not really a whole lot of life, maybe just some single cell bacteria, whatever, kind of hanging out. And then 400 million years ago, some evolutionary thing happened where plants could figure out how to live on land. And they basically colonized all the continents and they sucked, you know, plants love CO2. They turn CO2 into their bodies and you know basically then sequester co2 out of the atmosphere and that sucked a bunch of co2 out of the atmosphere and kind of turned the planet from a pretty toasty place into a very cold place um so that was kind of a fun thing that happened um and then another interesting trend here is you know there was like a local peak about 50 60 million years ago right this temperature peak and actually what happened one of the big drivers for the cooling since then is india crashed into Asia, right? So if you guys know, um, you know, plate tectonics from, you know, basic uh, elementary school and middle school science class and stuff like that, right? The continents move around. When India crashed into Asia and the Himalayas rose, it actually exposed a bunch of rocks to a weathering called silicate weathering that actually takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so there's this big background trend um, for the last few tens of millions of years where, you know, thanks to the Himalayas, a bunch of CO2 has been drawn out of the atmosphere and it's kind of made the planet uh, pretty cool, like substantially cooler than it used to be, right? So this is temperature versus today. This is Celsius, right? Relative, so zero is roughly today's average. And so plus 12 degrees Celsius is, you know, it's roughly two, you know, so to convert that to Fahrenheit, like 24 degrees warmer. So if the average temperature today, let's say it's literally, I don't know, you know, 70 degrees uh, day and night today, then the average 50 million years ago was 94, right? Day and night. And so it was way toastier. Um, anyway, so thank you Himalayas for making it not so hot. So um, someone so was some asking, Go ahead. oh, sorry. Someone was uh -huh. asking, um, do greenhouse gases ever leave atmosphere naturally? Awesome question. They do, but very depending on the gas, very slowly. So we're going to get to that. That's a great question. So hold hold on to that one. 
Um, okay, some other fun stuff. If you guys remember your dinosaur science, right? This is kind of the age of the dinosaurs. Again, pretty toasty land, right? That's why the lizards were doing great uh, because they can handle heat pretty well. Um, you know, in this very warm period after the KT boundary, right? So the KT boundary here is when the giant asteroid hit and killed all the dinosaurs. Reasons to have a space program. Um, shameless plug. And, um, you know, it was very toasty and there were like rainforests at the poles, right? North and South Pole because it was so hot and steamy on the planet. And if you zoom in closer to today's time, right? Human Homo sapiens, right? The most recent version of the lineage of humans have really only been around for about 200,000 years. So we've evolved in this, this little 200,000, you know, year wide box. And you can see these are the ice ages, these kind of up and down swiggles here. These are all ice ages where we kind of go from, you know, large parts of the planet are frozen over to kind of nice and warm, like we have now to frozen over again and nice and warm, right? Reasonably warm interglacial periods. So humans for a long time had to deal with these giant swings in climate, which makes it really hard to kind of build a civilization, right? And that's kind of a key point here is if you can kind of ask like big picture view, right? You guys should always be thinking critically, like, gee, if we've been around 200,000 years, how come, you know, civilization is only 10,000 years old? Well, guess what? The climate has only been reasonably stable for the last 10,000 years, right? And what's, why does that matter? Once the climate is kind of nice and stable, then next year is going to be kind of like last year. You can start planning, right? It's not just like crazy wild ride roller coaster that you're just trying to hold on to for, you know, dear life and survive. You can plan ahead. You're like, hey, if the next few years this way, let's whatever, start farming, right? And that's what happened, right? So human civilization, the rise of human civilization coincides pretty dramatically with this kind of flat, the most recent flat line in the climate. That's an important point. Okay, so again, a point to make here is that Look, you know, we all know the climate has been changing forever. The planet could care less, right? That's just what physics and life and stuff do. Um, so it, it, Earth is more or less happy, like it doesn't really care what's happening with the climate. But the life that's alive today, right, evolved to some specific conditions. And so if you change the climate back to what it was, whatever, a few million years ago or 100 million years ago, then the life that's around today, including you and me and your parents, you know, and everybody else we love, might not be so happy, right? Because that's not the climate we've evolved for. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a key key point. Um, so someone had asked, um, based on this graph, um, uh -huh. where does Ice Age fall under? So the Ice Ages are here. You can kind of see basically everywhere where like the temperature is below, I don't know, like, you know, around that minus five point, those are Ice Ages. So there's lots of Ice Ages. These Ice Ages happen like roughly every, 50 to 100,000 years, you know, there's this periodicity. And that's a whole nother thing we can talk about, like what drives those ice age periodicities, but we think we figured out that puzzle. Um, so yeah, they're like roughly every 100,000 years, plus or minus a little bit. Um, over the last few million years is when we've had ice ages. Good question. Okay. All right, so how do we know all that, right? One really important question is like, well, how the heck do you even know? Like, holy cow, 500 million years ago, that's a long time. How do we know anything about that? And it's not like we're talking to your grandparents, right? About, hey, how was it 500 million years ago when the dinosaur, before the dinosaurs were around? Um, so how do we know? So we use climate proxies, um, you know, and these are basically uh, what we call noisy sources, right? They're not perfect, but they can tell us a lot about the climate in the past. And so I'm just going to list those real quick, right? So you guys have heard of these tree rings. You know, um, we can use tree rings for about 10,000 years of history to get information on rainfall, sunlight, lots of other stuff. Um, coral reefs and other fossil shells, right? So corals, they actually embed a bunch of chemical information when they make their shells. And so do other fossil shells that fall to the ocean floor and other places. And we can kind of do some chemical analysis of those shells and figure out uh, temperature in the past and other things um, based on that. And then also ice cores, right? We go to Antarctica and Greenland and we've drilled like kilometer deep ice holes, ice cores, and then these actually trap gas, like literal gas molecules that are up to a million years old. And then you can just sample that gas. You can literally sniff the gas that's up to a million years old and see directly what the chemical composition is. And so we compare all these things to each other 
and cross calibrate them and kind of make sure we understand what's going on. And that's what lets us put together pictures like this, right? So it's like a hundred, you know, scientists working for the last hundred years, putting together all of these complicated pieces of information and putting together this like really cool kind of puzzle mystery, you know, murder mystery of uh, climate over the age, over the age of the earth, which is one of the things that if, if you like that kind of stuff, it makes science pretty fun, even though it's a little slow trying to figure that out. So, and then there's obviously other things like rock records and Grand Canyon, you know, like in the Grand Canyon and stuff that tells us a lot about. It. So, anyway, so that's that's how we know. Um, and then a little bit else about, you know, this stuff. So people talk about, well, gee, it doesn't hasn't CO two varied, right? This, you know, we we look at the CO two record from those items over the last three hundred thousand and even fifteen million years. And you compare that to what's happening to red, the red line CO2, the blue line methane, right? And these are huge spikes, right, in these greenhouse gases, the likes of which we have not seen easily for, you know, again, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, right? And so despite this kind of natural variability, um, you can't use that natural variability to explain kind of the fluctuations in the gases in the recent you know, um, greenhouse gases have definitely been this high before in the past, but again, it was a very toasty planet um, and lizards were way better off than mammals, right? And we being mammals, that's not necessarily good for us. So another little bit of, you know, using those proxy records, these are all like different temperature curves that you see here of history, you know, and then the black line is thermometers, right? We've only had thermometers for about 200 years. Um, all these other things are kind of proxy records of temperature. And again, you can see some variability, right? You know, there's definitely trends. These things all kind of agree, you know, they, they agree with each other to within a few tenths of a degree Celsius. That's not perfect agreement, but it's pretty close, right? And so you can see this natural variability, right? Recent natural variability. And this current spike is definitely something different, right? It's a very, there's a lot of signal here saying this is not normal, right? And the past, you know, as again, like we said, for millions of years. Okay, so that's a little bit of, you know, what we know about climate and why we are very confident that humans are causing the problem, you know, and you could take a, well, you can get a PhD in this stuff, right? We could spend years and years talking about these things, but this is kind of the high level, again, basic description of, of what we know and how we know it. So then I wanted to hit maybe a few more points, right? There's definitely a lot of people that are out there, you know, the fossil fuel industry, other people who kind of benefit from just not changing how we do things, right? So they try to kind of confuse the issue um, and, you know, versus what the facts are that we've built up over the last hundred you know, plus years of scientific, scientific inquiry. And so ju just to kind of debunk a few of those, right? So, you know, one of the things is like, hey, climate's changed before. And like I showed you guys, yeah, we know it has, it's changed a lot, but not with us around. And so the whole point is we don't want to die. Right, so um, let's keep things the way they are, so we don't have to deal with too much kind of chaos from things changing too much. Um, there's no, you know, people also say, hey, there's no consensus between the client and the climate community, and that's that's also not true, right? The vast majority of scientists all agree that climate change is happening and it's driven by humans. People also say animals and plants can adopt. Yes, of course they can, right? And animals and plants have been adopting for millions of years. But usually a lot of them die in the process. And again, so we don't want that to happen. We kind of like, we grew up with the animals around us today, right? We kind of coexist with a lot of them and they're very useful to us. So we'd rather not have us and or many of our, you know, kind of fellow creatures that are walking on the earth right now all just bite the dust. Um, you know, people also say it's the sun. I talked about that. It's definitely not the sun. The sun's actually been getting a little bit less bright in the last 35 years, right? It's actually helping us a little bit right now. Um, you know, and its periodicity kind of goes up and down in brightness a little bit, and that's, you know, definitely not the cause. And then other people are like, oh, it's not going to be that bad. Don't worry about it. Um, and this is where, I mean, you know, we, we could debate things, but, you know, one interesting data point is, you know, in 2011, if you guys know your history, right, there was basically a big food price spikes. Um, and a lot of the Middle East, including Syria, erupted in like civil war and civil strife and governments fell. And there was a huge refugee wave, right? It was like maybe up to the order of 10 million people that basically kind of couldn't live where they were anymore and had to find new homes. And that caused all kinds of problems in Europe and America, right? With refugees and right-wing parties and lots of political issues. 
And so climate change might force hundreds of millions of people to move because the part of the world they're living in might be too hot, might be underwater or whatever. And so, so far human societies haven't been great at absorbing a few, you know, like 10 million people moving around. And so trying to stress the system by moving hundreds of million people around, it might also be a bad thing to try, right? It might get a little ugly. And then there's kind of one of these last ones, which is a little bit more tin foil hat, even more tin foil hat, which is like, hey, doing stuff about climate is all gonna make us like into a communist country, right? With the UN taking over the world, right? And it's like, what? Like this makes completely no sense. Like most of the solutions for climate change are actually decentralized, right? Like getting solar panels and batteries on your house and having an electric car means you can be independent of anybody. You can go live by yourself and not care about the government, right? The first order. So a lot of the solutions, um, you know, help freedom um, and decentralization of anything, though there will need to be a, for some collective action, right? There definitely has to be coordination to help solve the problem, but that's not gonna, you know, you can do that without, you know, you're still maintaining people's freedoms, open societies, et cetera. So this is a little bit uh, in my mind, uh, kind of out there, not very credible point. Though I do, you know, I agree, like it would suck to turn into an autocratic dictatorship, right? Nobody wants that. Most of the climate community doesn't want that either. But uh, I just think it's a leap to make that connection um, when we try to solve the problem. So anyway, that's kind of that part. So then the, this is just a tiny bit of so what, right? A little bit more detail of what does it actually mean? So be before I jump into that, this is the question of how long do the gases hang around? So here's CO2. So methane, before I talk about CO2, methane only lasts like maybe 100 years. So it's like a very potent gas, but after order of 100 years, most of it kind of goes away again. It gets kind of broken up by sunlight. So it's a more short-term actor, even though it's very potent. CO2 is what you see here. And this is kind of an experiment where, you know, in a model based on chemistry, our, you know, how we know the chemistry of CO2 and kind of the earth works. Um, if you double, you go from 400 parts per million to 800, right? You double it. Um, how long does it take to come back? And it's, you know, sorry, wrong number. This was 280, right? And, and then you, I guess, triple it, uh, you know, roughly triple the number. Um, how long does it take to, take to, come, to come back? And, and CO2, right? Like you still have 50% of it after 200 years, right? It's a long time. Um, and even more than like 10% after 30,000 years, right? So because the natural techniques for removing CO2 from the atmosphere are pretty slow, you know, you are committing to keeping that gas, once it comes out of your tailpipe or whatever, it's going to be up there for a long, long time, right? Unless we go actively remove it. So that's kind of one of the downsides. And then this is, this chart talks about that a little bit. Um, you know, th this here's CO2 emissions over time, you know, per year, and then this is temperature. And so even if you're on the green curve, right, we do what we want, which is we spike right now and we, and we're kind of, we're on the blue curve right now, probably, you know, like naturally we're starting to hit between the blue and red. It's not as bad as the red, right? We, humanity is making progress, turning this over, but we're not anywhere near the green curve yet. That's what we need to get on. But even if you hit the green curve of getting emissions back to zero uh, by the end of the century, um, because of that inertia, right, the CO2 stays in the atmosphere, you're still stuck with, you know, like a more than two degree to four degree um, warmer planet in Fahrenheit, right? So we're kind of probably stuck in one of these, uh, um, even if we take some pretty drastic action. But taking action is still way better than just continuing on, right? The last time the earth was this warm, this red line was like 4 million years ago. And again, back to, you know, different critters were roaming the planet back then because the climate was different. Um, okay, then on the money side, we'll just hit this a little bit, right? So this plot kind of shows um, temperature increase, like how much do you allow the world to warm up and what's the impact in percentage of the world, or I guess in this case, the U.S. is the American gross domestic product, um, but it's roughly the same for the whole planet, right? So as you increase temperature, damage from storms, fire, right? Increased storms, increased fires, sea level rise, heat waves, all of these things start moving you up this, you know, how much you're paying per, uh, pretty steeply. And this doesn't take into account, right? Any of the like unknown weird instability issues like mass migration, war, et cetera, that can also happen um, from climate change, especially heat waves, you know, killing a bunch of crops and people getting hungry and stuff like that, right? Things that we wanna avoid. So this is kind of the minimum cost and it's probably worse. Um, 
And then on the mitigation side, doing something about it is relatively cheap compared to that, right? Typically, like most of the studies kind of show maybe one to 2% of gross domestic product. And, um, you know, sometimes even like net gain, right? So it's, anyway, so it's, it's better, right, to go do something about it. So I'm going to go through this pretty quick because I realized for the last 20 minutes, we got to talk about careers, right? So bottom line, climate's warming, humans are causing it. Um, you know, it's climate change is a risk to society because we've kind of optimized ourselves and our civilization around this very stable climate that we've had for the last 10,000 years. That's why people, the, the science world gets nervous, not because of other changes. Um, and again, it's never too late to act. Um, Actually solving the problem is pretty straightforward from a physics perspective, but the politics is hard, right? Human systems are very complicated and trying to get that change to happen is hard. And that's where we need, you know, like, you know, we've got a lot of people trying to work on that, as you know, today, and we could also use the next generation of, of folks to kind of get involved and help us change this and help put pressure on people to make the changes happen. And, you know, the main thing is we're learning more and more working on the solutions probably is a good thing. It's probably a net positive for the, you know, for the environment. It's going to make the air cleaner. You're going to live like more positive, healthy lives. You know, it's almost nothing but win-win. Um, but there is this pain of, yes, there will be coal workers that are out of work and we need to get the coal workers new jobs, right? And other business, you know, fossil fuel workers and stuff like that. We definitely need to, there are impacts and we need to help those people. You know, that's a non-trivial thing. Somebody try to feed their family. We need to help those people. But, you know, I think most folks think we can. Um, retraining, getting folks into other work. There's tons of work to do to help solve this problem. Okay, so I'm going to keep moving and we'll save some questions maybe for the last five or 10 minutes here. This is going to be a little quick careers, right? So I'm not going to talk about the politics and policy side so much, mostly about engineering and science. Engineers build awesome stuff, right? So engineering 101 a little bit, you know, engineers are problem solvers, right? They critical thinking, math, but you don't have to be great at math and you can still be a good engineer to build you know, develop new ideas, products, technologies. Um, so engineering jobs are very secure, right? There's huge opportunities in engineering, very low unemployment, especially if you care at all about the work you're doing. Um, you know, some studies say there's like one engineer available for roughly every almost two jobs that are out there, right? So there's a huge shortage out there. Um, the jobs are very meaningful, right? You're working on real stuff that's driving the economy. And if you work on climate or related things, um, you know, you're helping kind of, you know, the species survive, right? So kind of cool stuff. Um, and you get paid well. So typically today's dollars, 60 to $70,000 a year starting salary with a bachelor's. And by the time you're 20 or more years in, you, you know, if you're kind of a, you know, a hotshot engineer or whatever, you, you can make more than 200K easily, especially if you're, you know, working for Google or whatever kinds of companies, right? Depending on if it's a government job versus private industry. So, Anyway, so that's kind of good stuff to keep in mind. Diversity is still a little as an area that still needs improvement. Roughly 15 to 20 percent of the workforce is female. About 25, 27 percent, you know, a quarter in the U.S. is non-white ethnicity. So if you're in one of those areas, female or minority, yeah, it's a little bit of an uphill battle. Um, but you know, the environment's getting better and better, and everybody's getting more and more open to all that diversity. I think most people, most of the smart people. In industry recognize diversity is nothing but positive, right? And so the trend is really good, I would say there. Um, and I would encourage folks to, you know, jump in if, if this, I don't, this kind of work that I'm about to talk to you about uh, sounds at all interesting. Okay, science 101, right? Um, so here you're mostly advancing knowledge versus engineers are trying to like build things, right? Using knowledge to build new stuff. Science is mostly trying to understand what's going on. Why is, why is the world work the way it does, you know? Um, with some applications as well, but it's a little bit more focused on advancing knowledge. There's both applied science, you know, and those jobs tend to be more secure. Academia, i.e. working for a university or a research place might be a little bit harder to get a job. Um, so your passion and skill there is gonna be a little bit more important than in engineering to get a job that you want, right? Engineering, like if you have a heartbeat <laughs> and, and a working brain, um, you're likely to get a, a, some kind of job. Uh, science might be a little bit more tricky depending on what you wanna do. Um, again, the jobs are very meaningful, right? You're working on these really important things, advancing humanity, um, or you can be. And similar to engineering, they pay really well, right? So, um, and diversity is a little bit better than engineering. Uh, you know, substantially more females, uh, a little bit more minorities. But um, again, you're going to have to put up with a little bit of, you know, the old white guy thing. 
Um, but again, I think this is getting better and better over time and people are recognizing it. So I'd encourage you to jump in, just be ready to you know, have to deal with a little bit of that stuff, depending on where you're working. So, all right, so that's the basics. This is a little bit of a complicated thing maybe. Um, and I just kind of want to show, look, you know, when we look at systems, right, the earth human system in the middle here, you have human activity, you have the earth system, they play together, they create a state of the planet, right? Um, and we want, you know, we kind of want as humans, you want to keep living, right? We want civilization to keep going. So we want a reasonably stable earth and we want human society to be resilient and people to be happy and healthy, right? That's kind of the input, the control signal you want. Um, and so in the system to kind of understand what's going on, right? We have earth observations, both from space and, you know, things like the thermometer in your backyard, right? We measure the planet to understand what it's doing and we have models that are getting better and better all the time to kind of predict what the planet's going to do in the future, right? So this is a little bit like this oversimplified control diagram um, if you want to keep a healthy, happy planet. And so, you know, the reason I'm showing you guys this um, is to kind of say, hey, depending on where, you know, what job you want, you can play in different parts of this system, right? So down here, understanding what's happening, we call the climate intelligence community. So that's NASA, you know, the space agencies, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency that does weather, a little bit of Defense Department, a little bit of other agencies, also private companies and stuff like that, kind of do stuff to figure out what's going on. And then if you're the government, we give that information away for free. If you're the private sector, you sell that information to people that want it. Um, of course, you can get involved with politics, right? Uh, executive and legislative branches of government kind of decide, hey, what is our goal, right? Hopefully, if you're sane, you want a stable earth and happy humans, right? That should be everybody's goal um, that we're trying to hit. And then the control signal, what are we trying to do, right? So we set up the market, ideally regulations, technology to hit that goal, right? Given what's happening to the planet, um, you know, we want clean energy, and that's like, you know, uh, Department of Energy, also Department of Defense, a lot of private businesses, human behavior, right, impacts how we, uh, how we act and then how the Earth system responds, right? So that's kind of the overall system diagram. Um, so again, the thing for you to think about is like, hey, you know, what part of this problem, if you want to play in this world, where do you want to work, right? Do you want to be in the Intel community, the what's going on and what's going to happen in the future, or just go do something about it community, which is up here, you know, build electric cars or whatever. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna just rip through jobs real quick, right? So on the Intel side, right, we build spacecraft, right? So you can get involved with building spacecraft, building models. This is an Earth observation constellation that NASA flies. Um, you know, here's a bunch of engineers in a clean room, you know, at a private contractor building Earth observation spacecraft, right? That's a, a set of jobs. Climate science, right? The what, why, and what of the what the future might look like kinds of jobs right so we build climate models to do these predictions that we show, I showed you guys earlier um you know you have to go do field work to figure out <laughs> what happened in the past to help you know design those models properly and check the models against the past you know you get to do other field work out in in the world you know if you want to be a field biologist or whatever you know you get to do some cool stuff outside if you don't like being inside including maybe hanging out in antarctica and drilling those drilling those cores to figure out what happened, you know, a few hundred thousand years ago in the climate. Uh, and then there's big data, big science needs, right? So there's tons of information out there. You guys are on the internet, you're on YouTube all the time. You know how much info there is out there. Um, and so organizing that information and making sense of it is massively important, including all these new spacecraft we're building on the NASA side and private industry side. We're generating just mountains and mountains, and mountains of data about the earth and we need to process it to get info, knowledge, wisdom, and make decisions from that, right? So there's a lot of jobs in big data and data science. This is a really hot field. If you want to get, in, if you like coding and looking at data and stuff like that. Um, then of course, there's the do something about it side, right? So uh, building cars, like clean cars, clean transportation. This is the Ford Mach E. Um, clean energy, like windmills, solar panels, geothermal, right? Lots of stuff to get involved with there. Designing, you know, doing better job with recycling. This is a hugely important area. Um, if I was going back to school, I would think about maybe starting a company that was, um, you know, doing a better job of recycling in the world. And there are companies that are doing these things. Other jobs include climate adaptation, right? So we know sea level is going to rise. There's a certain amount that's just baked in that we're stuck with. And so if you like building big things, right, building seawalls in a creative way that still look cool, right, there's jobs like that in the future, civil engineering jobs climate risk management, 
you know, so understanding what's going on, talking to businesses about what they're concerned about, helping businesses and, and private enterprise and government deal with climate risk and manage it, right? Those are like economists, engineers, scientists can all get involved with that stuff. Those are growing, that's a growing field. And then the broader thing, you know, stop digging the hole, um, you know, building a better kind of more holistic economy. Um, and here I really want to emphasize kind of chemical science and engineering where, you know, we still want like our quality of life, right? There are ways to still maintain our quality of life and, you know, have cool toys and other things. We just need to design them in a way where they're easier to recycle, easier to reuse, you know, don't have so many bad byproducts, um, et cetera. And so there's a lot of work. There's actually like a new engineering field. If you're applying to colleges these days called like life cycle engineering, where you take into account the whole like design, make it, distribute it, trash it, reuse it, you know, uh, cycle and you try to design products like with that whole system in mind to really minimize what ends up in the waste and maximize repair and reuse, maximize uh, recycling material and getting it back in there. So this is hugely important, right? And really a cool area to get into. Um, and similar thing for farming. Right now we have farming techniques that kind of substantially trash the planet, right? And are not very sustainable. Um, and there's a lot of ways that people are showing you can do uh, farming that's just as productive, if not more productive, that's way better for the planet and also for the food that we eat. So if you wanna be a farmer, there's a lot of cool stuff to do there, um, getting to regenerative agriculture and other kind of smart techniques. Um, and then of course, there's cleaning up the mess, right? So we are, there is you know a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere already, um, and we need to help eventually get that out. Like, even if we're getting better at reducing how much we put into the atmosphere, eventually getting to zero, we still have to suck some of it out. Because as you saw, it takes hundreds, if not thousands of years for that stuff to, for the CO2 to naturally come out. And so we are starting to look at capturing the CO2 from the atmosphere and sequestering it, both, you know, using natural systems, like growing more trees um, and human systems with energy that basically um, like run a power plant backwards and capture CO2 and, and put it in underground. Okay, so a little bit here, I'm just gonna paraphrase this, right? If you guys are Lord of the Rings fans, um, epic journeys, right? That's kind of a fun thing in life. You're the adventure of your life. Uh, so I, I try to tie things into that a little bit. Um, just a few terms and then we'll, we'll hit the Q and A, right? This is me paraphrasing Frodo basically saying, man, you know, living today's world kind of sucks. There's a lot of tough stuff going on. Gandalf saying, yeah, I know, but, <laughs> Like you can't change any of that, right? You're kind of stuck with the world that we have. So you can't, don't fret too much about what got us to the place we are and worry, worry about how you can fix it, right? Like what you can do to help make the problem better, right? That's kind of what this part of Lord of the Rings hits on. And so that last part is like, think about stepping up. You know, there's a lot of cool, well-paying jobs that are very rewarding. Um, and if you want to get engaged, we, we definitely need your help to help uh, kind of solve the problem. And we'd love to have you on our team. So that's that's it. And I think we have a few minutes for talks. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel, for that presentation. Um, so we do have a few questions uh, I okay. wanted to mention. Um, so someone was asking about um, what like classes can they take in high school at the moment that you think would be helpful to get them into some of these career paths? Okay, yeah, great, great question. So um, as you know, the cliche thing usually is math and science, right? Like your physics, your chemistry, your math. Um, so doubling down on that is, is usually the best thing. And I, but I do wanna say, you don't have to be a math genius, right? So like, I actually, you know, like, um, took calculus, you know, and a bunch of other math. And in, in my job in the last 10 or 15 years, I haven't used a ton of it. So if you can just kind of get through it, know the basics, but then if you don't enjoy it, it doesn't mean you're stuck with it <laughs> forever, right? But like hunker down and learn it. And there's lots of aids out there, right? Go to all the different online learning things. If you're having trouble, if your teacher isn't great at explaining it for you, um, I would encourage you to, to go out and do that. And then, sorry, and one last thing, um, also leadership and just getting your hands dirty, right? So like doing like high school robotics, right? Or if you're a scientist, if there's like environmental science stuff or just learning about nature, going on field trips, right? Like actually doing the job kind of in the baby steps that you can in high school um, is really 
helpful. And also on your resume, both for applying, it gives you nice essays to write for college. And then when you're applying for jobs, right, people are looking for passionate individuals. They're looking for somebody who actually cares, <laughs> right? They're coming into work because they want to be there. And so they're going to give it their all. And so you want to show people that you care about the thing and getting involved with like school clubs, again, robotics, science, whatever is a way to show the world that you're passionate about that thing. So someone was asking too, um, which of these sectors would policy and legislation go into? Like how how can how can how can um being like setting up policies and legislation help with these? Oh yeah. So let me go back to the control diagram. Um, yeah, so that, that is actually hugely important, right? So, I mean, we, as a society, right, democratic society, we rely on executive branch and legislative branch to kind of set the direction, right? So getting involved there and actually caring, you're setting policies that are science-based is, is really important because you're helping set up the environment for the rest of the system to do its thing, right? Hey, you're going to listen to the scientists that are telling you, hey, you might want to pay attention to this, right? Otherwise, we're going to have problems. And then you're enabling, you know, you want to set up the environment, the market for private companies and government labs to help solve the problem. So, yeah, I mean, if you're passionate about this, but you want to go work in politics, that's great. I, you know, maybe a thing to think about is either minoring in politics and getting a major, like your primary degree in science first, you know, and then getting a master's in politics or something like that. Um, or at least minoring, like definitely bone up on your science, right? Because you, you want to understand what people are telling you and be able to tell the difference between somebody selling you some snake oil, right? Like faking you out <laughs> versus maybe being semi-honest, right? So you got to be a little bit smart in the area. But I mean, yeah, we definitely need people in, in the policy side too. Good. Uh, and then someone else also asked, um, is, what, what was the peak of the climate change? So we haven't... Um, let me look at my charts real quick here. So, uh, the peak hasn't, right? We are just beginning to feel the pain, right? So I don't want to mince words, right? Peak, peak climate change hasn't hit us yet. Um, peak emissions, um, I think I have a chart that might show that. Yeah, so, um, Peak emissions, we may or you know, we probably also haven't hit, right? Like we are starting to turn, we're starting to turn this curve over, but it's still kind of going up, right? And it's, you know, so there's like India and China and and, and a little bit of other countries are still building a lot of fossil fuel, you know, power plants and things like that. And partly, you know, because they need to to get energy to their people, you know, so it's understandable, but we're yeah, we are turning the curve, but we have a long ways to go. Um, so, yeah, it's going to get toastier before it gets colder. <laughs> so, buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> so, some someone was saying it might be a little controversial, but um, uh -huh. they wanted to ask, um, would eating less beef help? Um, sure. So, I mean, definitely agriculture, and I mean, you know, so you know, people have done budgets of like, what's the greenhouse gas footprint, right, of all the different things we do, including foods we eat and other activities we have. And yeah, uh, cows and other, I think, you know, animals similar to cows um, are kind of, and foods from them are the biggest footprint. So that that is definitely something that you could do um, to reduce your footprint is eat less red meat, you know. Okay. And then someone was asking um, about engineering and Paul, well, you answered that part already about having um, like interested in being in a biology science as well as politics. So you said to probably major or minor, minor yeah, in science. I, I, mean, I would say like, you know, double majoring or minoring. Yeah. And usually, I mean, maybe the, the policy side people will take offense. It, I think if you're smart enough to know the science, the, the policy side might be easier. And so maybe getting your first degree in the science to get that out of the way and then mm -hmm. going to a, a softer science. But that's my bias. I could be wrong. People might be throwing tomatoes at me right now, you know, because I'm an engineer, <laughs> right? So, um, and the other thing, I mean, one, one last comment there, maybe before you become a politician, like actually working for a company and like 
being an engineer or a scientist for a little bit and actually solving a problem or delivering a product, I think is really useful experience. And if you can bring that experience over to the political side, that probably would help you be a more effect, like maybe push for more effective policies versus like if you just had a law background and all you ever did was law, right? Um, Anyway, so understanding how the machinery of the economy works and what it takes to get stuff done in the economy would probably make you a better lawmaker. Again, my editorial, not NASA opinion, right? So. I mean, it is five o'clock, so we do, uh, maybe yeah. we'll take a few more questions. If yeah, your that's choice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Okay, so someone has to ask about um, engineering, because you mentioned earlier about engineering jobs, and um, there's uh -huh. about uh, every 1.9 jobs available. Um, or there's a lot of engineering jobs out there. So does that mean we're not short of engineers? It, well, we are short of engineers. So yeah, it says, I think not a lot of engineers in the world, right? So relative to the jobs, yeah, there are not enough engineers. And I think part of that is, you know, I mean, engineering and science degrees, you know, they are maybe harder than the other degrees, right? Your brain's gonna hurt a little more. You're gonna have to exercise your brain a little more. Um, and, and maybe so people shy away, right? But I think the, the thing to keep in mind, right? If you're having any doubts, right? Like investing four years and, and maybe just knuckling down in a harder degree gives you 80 years of payback, right? Like the rest of your life, you're probably gonna be making more money, <laughs> maybe doing more, you know, making it easier for you to find a job, et cetera. And again, you can work on these pretty cool problems, right? If you want to. Um, and so just think of it as like, you know, if, if it scares you just to think of it as like knuckle down for a certain amount of time and just get through it, right? And and you can make it. And maybe I'll just um, mention one more. So someone's saying, is mm -hmm. there a too late uh, to get into the field? To get into the climate field? No, I mean, uh, like I try to say, so there's, we can, it's never too late to act, right? Because things can, if we delay action and then act later, acting later is still way better than never acting, right? And so um, point one, point two, as far as like finding jobs, I mean, I think, right, the whole green, whatever, like the climate world, the job growth will be increasing for a while, right? So we still have a lot, especially people that are on the, like on the call today, right? Like, you know, if you're 10, or 20, right? We definitely have a few decades easily of jobs building green infrastructure, you know, building more spacecraft, building all these things that kind of help. It's like decades worth of work, right? This is going to be a multi generational thing to fix to get our arms around and make better. So, you know, <laughs> um, if you're asking the question today, you're fine. Well, thank you for your time and thank okay. you for the presentation. Really appreciate yeah. it. Um, I do want to let people know that. Um, there are other upcoming virtual programs, so please join us. I'm going to put the link on here so everyone can see uh, for future. And then, um, and I don't think I have any other questions. Um, okay. Right now, so thank you for your time. We really yeah, appreciate thanks. it. Yeah, thanks everybody for showing up. Great questions. Appreciate you guys uh, hanging out.